So, Dr. Kripal, will you tell me a little bit about your work as a religious studies scholar? Um, sure. So I, well, I work in a lot of different areas. I, I, I'm a historian of religions, okay. which essentially means I compare things. I compare religions. And over the years, I've, I've worked in India. I've worked in California. Um, I've written a textbook. Um, I've worked a lot on popular culture and religion. I mean, I've done a lot of things. Um, but I suppose the goal is to help people um, think more critically and, and more sympathetically about religions with, with an S at the end. Okay. Uh, and how, how we negotiate, how people negotiate um, religious difference. Hmm. It's essentially the, the, the big question I work with. Yeah. So what brings you to teach at the Young Center? Well, um, so I was trained in a program at the University of Chicago that was founded by a man named Mirchi Eliadi. And Eliadi was uh, part of what we call the Aranos Group, which was a group of um, scholars of religion that met at a villa in Switzerland over many, many, many decades. And Carl Jung was sort of the de facto mentor or, or not host, but the, inf the, the de facto mentor of that group for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And um, he knew Eliadi, and Eliadi knew him. And so I've always uh, been attracted to Jung and, and have been reading him since college, really. Uh, he's, his intellectual instincts are very close to the kinds of ideas I was trained in. So it, it's a natural place to be drawn to. And um, how do you connect the ideas of Jung with your work today? Well, that's an interesting question. So I, yeah, I've, I've thought a lot. I've been teaching now, writing and teaching for about, um, gosh, uh, about 25 years now. And um, I think you could describe the first half of my career as very Freudian. Um, I worked primarily on issues of sexuality and gender and and thought a lot about Freud. And, and the second half of my career, I've thought much more with Jung. Um, I've thought much more about things like magic and synchronicity and precognition and what we call the paranormal, which were all really central interests of Jung. Um, so I sort of moved, it's not that I abandoned Freud, but I've sort of moved from Freud to Jung uh, in the second half of my life. Hmm. So. Has it, um, have you seen great changes in the way we define religion today? Well, I mean, the biggest change in religion uh, since I've been teaching, of course, was sort of post 9-11 and the way religion has been linked in the geopolitical scene to essentially terrorism and, and violence. Um, so I think the public as a whole is much, much more aware of how religious, religion and politics and, and violence are often linked. Um, and that wouldn't have been the case as much in the 70s or 80s. Mm -hmm. It would have been thought in different ways. Mm. Have you seen major changes in um, how people look at institutional religion and their own personal religion? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think your generation um, is just dropping it, dropping religion in droves. Um, I don't think they're dropping um, religious questions or, or spiritual sensibilities, but they're no longer aligning themselves with, with institutions or, or, or churches or synagogues in the way that certainly my generation still did and certainly the generations before mine did. Mm -hmm. So I think we're... we're you know, what we call the rise of the nuns and the spiritual but not religious are really the, in some sense, the next big thing, I mm -hmm. think, on, on the horizon. Yeah. And I think, by the way, Jung played a big role in that. I mean, that's essentially what he did, was move away from his family's um, Protestantism and towards a kind of private, private or individual religion, as it were. Why do you think people are drawn to um, abandoning the institutional aspect of religion? 
I think it's complicated. I think there are a lot of reasons. I think one of the big reasons is fundamentalist forms of religion have really um, grabbed the public square and the public discourse. And people associate religion now with exclusion and bigotry and hatred um, because of essentially because of fundamentalism of all forms, not just Christian. Um, and so I think young people who take for granted that human beings are different, um, they're gendered differently, they're sexualized differently, they're, they're um, ethnically and culturally different, those are all, I think, no-brainers mm. for young people who grew up in urban environments. Mm. Um, and they look out at the religious communities and they're just sort of appalled. Mm -hmm. um, and so they don't want to have anything to do with that. I also think though that um, particularly American society, I think you have to take it case by case, but with American society, at least in the urban areas, it's increasingly pluralistic mm -hmm. and it's very, very hard to hold a single worldview when you're living in a hundred of them. Hmm. Uh, I think that's much easier in the country or in rural environments. But I think it's very, very difficult in urban environments. Hmm. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you'd be the one to answer that question, right? Yeah. You might have more to say to it than, than I would. And it's, what do you think would happen to institutional religion further down the line in an urban setting? <clears throat> well, I'm not, uh, I'm not a particular fan of what we call the secularization thesis, the idea that, that, that culture, Western culture and, and human beings will become increasingly secular and less and less religious. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that's possible um, for one simple reason. I, I think people have souls, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. and that they're innately religious. Mm -hmm. We have religious instincts and religious questions because we're not just our bodies, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean they have to affiliate in the same way mm -hmm. with social institutions. I think there are lots of ways to, for human beings to express themselves in religious or spiritual ways, and I don't think uh, church attendance or people sitting in a particular building on a particular day of the week is, is necessarily um, the only way to do that. Mm -hmm. So what, what will it look like? I don't know. I don't think we do know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we can know. Mm -hmm. But my guess is it'll be much more decentered, decentralized and much more creative um, or, or looser. So it seems like psychology has taken on a lot of um, a lot of the roles religion used to take on for people who identify as spiritual but not religious or don't identify with religion. What do you think of the um, increasing emphasis on um, empirical and biological phenomena in the psychology community? I think it's I think it's a perfectly legitimate avenue of research, but I think it's a dead end when it comes to religious questions or spiritual questions. Mm -hmm. I don't think at the end of the day that consciousness is produced by the brain. I think the brain's more like a receiver or a reducer. Mm -hmm. We're more like smartphones uh, and there's a Wi-Fi signal out there mm -hmm. and we're not producing that. We're picking it up and, and translating it into Zoe or, or Jeff. We're, we're essentially a, an interface um, and I know that's pure heresy in the sort of cognitive side or academic psychology worlds, but uh, I think that is what all of the, well, not all, but many of the religious traditions point to. I think it's certainly closer to what Jung thought. Um, so I don't really have much hope in that kind of materialism or reductionism, either answering our questions about what mind is or certainly about meeting human spiritual needs. Quite mm -hmm. the contrary, I think it's inc 
incredibly depressing mm -hmm. and boring. What do you think is the appeal of people turning to this sort of empirical phenomenon to answer their questions? Well, you can get, you can get answers. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> you can like poke things and measure them and pretend you know something because you can attach a number to it. Um, it's a answer. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of fundamentalism again. It's a kind of easy answer to a, a difficult question. Um, Again, and it's not that it's illegitimate or, I mean, I'm, it's perfectly legitimate enterprise. It's just it can't answer the questions certainly I have or that, 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 that Jung had. Mm. So. Yeah. So you also study the paranormal. Mm -hmm. do, you see, um, do you see a lot of connections between mental health, psychological health, spiritual health, and the paranormal? Well... I think um, yes and no. Paranormal experiences are generally, they're both extremely common and extremely rare. They're extremely common in the sense that if you ask a population of any size whether they've had such an experience, you know, a large percentage of the people are going to report such an experience. So they're very common in that way, but they're very rare in terms of a single life cycle or a single individual. Mm -hmm person might have one of these in a life or none at all. Um, so I don't, I don't think they're always relevant to, to mental health, although sometimes they're extremely relevant. Um, people tend to have robust paranormal experiences around trauma and crisis and suffering and death. So in those cases, they clearly are serving some kind of potential therapeutic or healing role. And if we can take that seriously, I think we can encourage and nurture that healing process. Mm -hmm. And if we ignore it or demean it or dismiss it as unreal, I think we can do damage. Mm -hmm. um, so to that extent, yeah, I think they're potentially therapeutic, but not necessarily. You know, some paranormal experiences are quite negative. Mm -hmm. They're terrifying or they're, they're abusive or they're scary. They're not, it's not all peace and light. Hmm. And do you have um, an example off the top of your head of um, a paranormal experience being used to, uh, as a healing experience after trauma? Oh, sure. I mean, that was one of the most common paranormal uh, experiences is an apparition of a dead loved one who just died. Mm -hmm. So particularly among widows, uh, you know, so a widow is grieving and... Uh, her husband appears to her either in a, as an apparition or sometimes in full physical form and basically comforts the, the grieving widow, uh, which of course is how Christianity began too, um, with a, a dead man appearing to a, a, grieving, wi a grieving woman. Um, so, I mean, that's obviously therapeutic. It's extremely comforting to uh, people to whom that happens. But marked as insane by the psychiatric community. Maybe. What's that? But marked as insane by the psychiatric community. Maybe. Well, yeah, um, it used to be. I don't think apparitions of dead loved ones are pathologized today the way they were huh. a couple decades ago. I think we'd want to look at that. Um, but they once were marked as as hallucinations or marks of mental illness. But I don't. I doubt if they are anymore. I mean, huh. interesting. You'd have to look at the DSMV to, to take a look. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. And so in that sense, we can't stick to such a rigid definition of what normal health is. Right. R right. I, mean, I mean, the reason those things were marked as pathological is that they couldn't be real. I mean, I mean really, all of these questions boil down to the question of what's real or not. Mm -hmm. And... I think most of us live in a world where we assume that the only thing that's real is matter and, and the material objects in our environment. And so dead men or dead women can't appear. They don't, they're not, they don't exist anymore. They're dead. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, so the reason those things were marked as forms of, of hallucination or illness was they can't happen. They're not possible. Mm -hmm. So what's possible or impossible is really a function of our own assumptions about the world. It's, 
not a function of what's actually out there. Mm. And I, I think that's the deeper question all of this stuff pushes up against. Mm. And so what, um, what seems to cause um, paranormal phenomena that are negative? Well, we don't know. That is, is the right is the is the easy answer to that. There's different thoughts about that. Um, the the most traditional thought, the most ancient thought, is that some encounters are negative because there are negative spirits out there. There are demons that screw with us, and they're bad, and so that's scary. Other people aren't so sure. Um, I. Th my own kind of gut feeling, and that's all it is, is that when a person encounters another form of mind, which may be their own, and they're ready for that, they're ready to let go of their ego, then the experience will be positive. Mm. But if they're not ready to let go, it will be a negative experience. It'll be one of fear or, or terror. Mm. You know, terror and ecstasy are very, very close. It's just really a matter of, of they're both forms of, of transcendence, but one is you're ready for it and the other you're not. Huh. And so the same person could look at an apparition and find comfort or find extreme terror. Yep. And that's what the sacred is. If you look at it historically, if you look at God, for example, in the Bible, <laughs> you, he, it's terrifying or it's redemptive. It's both, depending on how that force or that being is approached, mm. whether one's ready or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think it can be either, but I think it's probably a function of us mm. and not of whatever else is out there. And so how do you define the paranormal? Um, so I define a paranormal event or experience as, as an event in, in which something is happening in the physical environment that corresponds almost perfectly to something going on in the mind of the person having that experience. So there's a kind of a, a deep correspondence going on between the, st the internal state and the exterior event. So for example, um, in a poltergeist event, a, a teenager might be extremely conflicted emotionally or sexually. And in the environment, things are blowing up or catching on fire or breaking in some way. So the, so the, the events are symbolic or pointing back toward the emotional state of the, the focal agent. Huh. So would you consider Jung's um, synchronicity yes. as, as yes, a... Yes, absolutely. Story? That's a classic. That's classic. You, you know, the paranormal was coined in about 1900 mm. by French scientists, and the, it's paranormal. Mm. And the reason they came up with the word is what they really wanted to say is the not normal, so it would be anormal in French, but anormal sounds exactly like abnormal, abnormal in mm. French. So they, they didn't want to pathologize it, huh. so they came up with this new word, paranormal to describe something like a poltergeist event. Huh. But they coined the word because they didn't think there were ghosts involved. They thought it was completely normal or natural. It was just, it was activating systems or processes in the, in, in the natural world that we, we simply have no map of yet. Hmm. So they were trying to get away from the ghost, huh. the angry, the, the noisy ghost of the poltergeist. And say that it's a function of how you interpret an experience. No, they were saying it was a function of this focal agent who was almost always ex in, in distress. And that somehow the distress was externalizing into the environment huh. in paranormal ways, in ways that were natural, but which we can't map yet, we can't understand. So affecting something without necessarily physically touching it. Correct. Huh. Correct. And, and Jung's synchronicity is just a, a much later framing of that ex same process mm. where something in the environment is essentially functioning as a sign or, or, or a signal of something happening inside the, the mind or body of the, of the person. Mm. Is, it, is it supposed to work both ways in terms of like cause and effect? 
Well, for Jung, there was no cause and effect in synchronicity. That's what a synchronicity was. It was an event, yeah, that was acausal. And again, I think this is where <laughs> the sciences mislead us. They go looking for causes, but there are no causes. Uh, whatever is, is performing those events is not working through causal mechanisms. It's working through symbolic um, linguistic or, or meaningful process. It's trying to convey meaning. It's not, it's not pushing this to push that to push that. And so in that sense, they're unpredictable. They're very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why we can't really, it's really hard to study these things in a, in a laboratory because you can't reproduce them. Mm. You, you never know when they're going to happen. And they also tend to have a kind of trickster quality. They, they actively seem to avoid um, being detected or measured. They seem to have an intelligence mm -hmm. of their own. And so are, um, are these studies based largely on primary accounts and um, pe people's direct experiences? Well, there's two forms. There's two, the, the, the study of these things splits into two camps. There's, mm -hmm. There's the, the, par the parapsychological camp, which is essentially the laboratory psychologists yeah. who are trying to um, isolate variables mm -hmm. and reproduce things and measure things and do a lot of statistics mm -hmm. on, on whatever it is they're trying to study. And then there are the folks um, who are much more like ethnographers or anthropologists, and they're simply talking to people to who, who've had some big, big experience like this. Huh. Um, so one, one's much more scientific and one's much more humanistic. Mm. And I'm, I'm much more in this camp. Okay. Not because I think this camp's illegitimate, it's just that's not what I do. Mm. Okay. And so you also study um, culture as well. And it seems like the paranormal is super pervasive in culture. So wh what do you think is the appeal to large audience. Well, uh, you know, in terms of culture, it's really popular culture. It's really film and comic books and television, um, horror movies, things like that. And I think the appeal is, is that um, <laughs> in our present day, we can't talk about the paranormal either in the religious institutions or, or in the elite uh, scientific or, or political institutions. And so it goes to the only institution that will have it, which is entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's where it goes. It just, it's like water. It's going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you block it here and here, it's going to flow there. Um, and and it, the entertainment industry is, I think, particular, particularly uh, apt for it um, because paranormal events often have a performative or, or stage-like quality to them. They, they appear to be performances. So there are deep, deep links mm. between entertainment and, and the paranormal. Mm. They go all the way back, probably all the way back to the ancient world, but certainly back to the 19th century. So it's even appealing for people who haven't necessarily had paranormal experiences themselves. Well, it's a way of being religious without being religious, right? It's a kind of camouflaged way of talking about the supernatural. That's, mm. what, it, that's what it is. Mm. Or magic. It's, the paranormal is really magic when you get right down to it. But of course, we can't say the word magic, and people can't say I practice magic, mm -hmm. but they can say I love Harry Potter, or you know, I'm, I'm in love with a teenage wolf boy or vampire or whatever it is. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a kind of indirect um, spirituality, I think. And so it's creeped into people's daily lives through culture, but they can't talk about it in other institutions. You can talk about it as long as you're talking about fantasy or fiction, but you can never talk about it as real. Hmm. That's, that's the rule. That nobody, Nobody's written down the rule, but I just told you what the rule is. You can, you can talk about anything you want as long as it's fantasy or fiction, but no politician will get up or no, sci no physicist will get up and say telepathy is real, even if they think it is. They might be personally completely convinced it is, but they will never, ever admit that in public because that breaks the, the agreement.
even in religious institutions where paranormal events are super common, mysticism, things like that? Well, the problem with that is, is in a lot of religious contexts, the paranormal is coded as demonic. It's literally demonized. So if it's unreal or, you know, new age woo-woo among the debunking community, it's literally demons mm. in, a lot, in a lot of churches. So that doesn't help much either. So it could be real, but it's just very negative. <laughs> Really, really, yeah, really, really negative. Yeah, there it's okay for it to be real as long as it's bad. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what do you see as kind of um, the most pressing issues in psychology and daily life? Oh, man, I don't, that's a big question. I, I don't know. In, in terms of what we've been to talking about, I think the big question is what we do with religious identity and how we talk about people being this or that kind of religious person. In other words, whether we see a religious identity as something that's added on later and is rather arbitrary, or whether we see it as the essence of the person. Hmm. I think that's what those spiritual but not religious uh, communities dealing with. They clearly see it as an add-on hmm. that is unnecessary, hmm. where religious fundamentalists see it as the essence of hmm. who the person is. How is it conceptualized in terms of not just um, how pluralistic you can be, but how dynamic you can be, how um, legitimate it is to switch religions or to um, keep changing beliefs throughout time? Well, if you take the position that religious identity is, is rather arbitrary and is something added on later, in, then it's easy to switch because you're just trying on different roles. You're trying on different, essentially, uh, imaginative worlds to live in. Mm -hmm. But if you think you're born, you know, as X, Y, or Z, then you can't, mm -hmm. you can't change that. Mm -hmm. You can't trade that for another one without severe consequences. Mm -hmm. I guess they kind of both can have their own, like, sources of anxiety. Yeah, I think so. I think people with really firm religious communities often uh, don't have the problems that people who don't have any community have. Hmm. I mean, there's no perfect solution here. Um, I grew up in a little farming community, and, uh, you know, there were people who stayed and there were people who left. And it's not like the people who left gained things that the people who stayed will never have. Mm -hmm. and the people who stayed gained things that people who left will never have. And it's not like one is right and one is wrong. It's just those are really different life paths. Uh -huh. and, um, it's, but it's not one isn't right and the other's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah.